from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. My name is Andrea Rohn. I anchor the early morning news for the CBS affiliate here in Washington, WUSA 9. Thank you. And I have the distinct pleasure of introducing a prodigiously gifted historian, a painstakingly thorough researcher, a lawyer, a writer, and it's all one individual, Annette Gordon-Reed. Professor Gordon-Reed is the living definition of a history detective. She followed clues for nearly nine years of her life, unlocking secrets buried in the 18th century. Her goal to reveal the truth about three generations of a slave family owned by President Thomas Jefferson. Her fascination with Thomas Jefferson and her love of books began at an early age. In fact, in the third grade when she first read about Thomas Jefferson. A few years later, she read another book about Jefferson and one chapter alluded to the slave Sally Hemings. And you can imagine, this is probably where her desire to find out more about Jefferson, about the Hemings began. Her first book, Thomas Jefferson and How Sally Hemings, An American Controversy, received great acclaim and great controversy. The latest, The Hemings of Monticello, An American Family, shines an even brighter light on the Hemingses and puts a complicated relationship into perspective. For her clarity of vision, the bracing originality of her approaches, and her uncompromising commitment to the truth, Annette Gordon-Reed was rewarded with the prestigious National Book Award in 2008, and in 2009, she received the Pulitzer Prize for nonfiction. Please welcome Annette Gordon-Reed. Thank you, thank you very much. It's, it's wonderful to be here, to see all of these book lovers. This is the first time I've ever been to the festival, so this is, this is an amazing time for me. The whole year has been amazing, as she just mentioned. Uh, it's something that was beyond my wildest dreams, and I'm very, very happy to be able to share this with you. I, I thought I would talk a little bit about the book. Uh, this is the book festival, and you want to know what it's about. You know what it's about generally. Um, my first book, Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings, an American Controversy, was really a book about what scholars had written about Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings. I'm sure you know the story, the story that Jefferson had a long-term liaison with an enslaved woman on his plantation, Monticello. And I was not writing so much about whether or not it was true. I thought, you know, having grown up in the South, knowing some things about slavery, that those types of relationships were common. So it seemed to me pretty banal. I mean, the idea uh, that a slave owner would have an, a mistress on the plantation. But what I really wanted to write about was how historians dealt with the subject and what it said about how black people's words were treated, black people's stories were treated uh, in American history. And slavery was uh, an institution, obviously, that affected black people, affected enslaved people. It wasn't just the story of the whites who owned them. It was the story of people who lived under that system. So when I was working on this book, I got the idea that, well, one of the reasons that I, th that perhaps one of the reasons that the Hemingses and their story was given short shrift among historians and other people was that people didn't really know very much about the Hemingses. Um, if you don't know about people, I think it's much easier to dismiss them, to see them as not important if you don't have a sense of connection to them. It's like when you, I've often said, when you meet a person in your neighborhood, for example, that you don't know, then all of a sudden you see them all the time, whereas before they've always been there, but you didn't know they were there. And so I thought I could take Jefferson's records, take the Hemings family history, take other letters and things that were written uh, about the Hemingses and to tell a story of this family. Um, there's not enough material to talk, uh, to do a really good biography of one person, but the family as a whole provides, I thought, enough material to come up with a book. And I was able to do this for, because as I said, Jefferson was an inveterate record keeper. He kept a farm book. Slavery was a business. 
and just businessmen keep inventories. And enslaved people as part of the property of a plantation were part of the inventory. So Jefferson kept a farm book listing the birth dates, the family configurations of all the people enslaved on his plantation. He was not unusual in this. Other slave owners did that as well. If you go to the University of Virginia, Alderman Library, you can go to go into the stacks, you can find other plantation records from slave owners who did the same thing. But he did something else that was a bit more unusual. He kept what he called memorandum books, which in which he listed his sort of daily accounts. Now lots of people did this as well, but not as many people were as diligent about it as he was. For example, if you went to the store and you bought a pound of coffee or whatever, you would come back and write, went to the store, bought a pound of coffee, and you would do that for every single expenditure that you had. He did that from the time he was in his 20s up into the time that he was in his 80s. And so you can see that's a very, very long record of a day-to-day -day life, and we can trace him, and we can trace many members of the Hemings family because a lot of the things that he was telling people to do, they were the ones sent James to, you know, to buy this, sent James to do this or that and the other, Martin and whatever. So I could tra tra you know, track the Hemings family through the memorandum books. The third thing was Jefferson had about 16 or 000, wrote about 16 or 17,000 letters in his lifetime. And he very often mentioned members of the Hemings family, other members of his family wrote about them occasionally. So from those three sets of documents, I had a start. Some members of the Hemings family were literate, so we have their stories as well to tell, and also other things that from other people who knew them, their family history, the one that the parts that's not written could also inform this. So I sat down to write, as was said about 10 years ago, and started on this long journey uh, and decided that the real focal point of the book, the most interesting person in the book to me, would be Elizabeth Hemings, who was the matriarch of the family. She is the person who would have known all of the principal characters, uh, all of her children, obviously, Thomas Jefferson, uh, John Wales, Jefferson's father-in-law, who actually was the father of six, six of her children. She would know the entire story. So it's, as a historian, if you want to sort of fantasize about bringing somebody back to talk to, she would be the person that I would say, okay, now, Elizabeth, tell me the real story here. What, who were, what were all these people like? So I divided the book into three parts. The first part is called, it's called Origins, and it talks about Elizabeth Hemings's early life, as much as we know about it. She was born in 1735, was owned by the Epps family, um, a member of that family marries a man named John Wales, who was an English immigrant, who buried three wives. He married one wife, and she died. He married a second wife, and she died. He married a third wife, and she died. And then he decided, apparently, that he did not want to get married again. So he took Elizabeth Hemings as a concubine. That's the way their grandchild describes their relationship. And they had six children. Um, the youngest one was named Sarah, who's that is Sally Hemings. Um, Sarah was her real name, and her nickname was Sally. At some point, John Wales' daughter, a daughter with his first wife, Martha, marries Thomas Jefferson. And so when she marries Thomas Jefferson, and then her father dies a couple of years later, the Hemings family comes to Monticello. So you have Jefferson and his wife, Martha, with these six siblings, with these six people who are the half-sisters of Jefferson's wife. And it's a situation that's unimaginable for us, to, something for us to contemplate, owning your siblings, owning your half-siblings. And she brings them to Monticello. They are installed as the sort of favorite house servants at Monticello. Um, her brother Robert, who is 12, becomes Jefferson's manservant. Jefferson has had a manservant, a man named Jupiter Evans, from the time he was a little boy. Um, and he replaces Jupiter, who was his same age. Actually, we think Jupiter's, there's some indication that Jupiter's mother may have been Jefferson's wet nurse. They were born the same year. And lots of times, in, uh, plantation mistresses did not nurse their own children. Enslaved women nursed their children. So Jupiter had been with Jefferson from the very beginning, Jupiter Evans. 
but he replaces him with his wife's half-brother, half Robert, as a 12-year-old. Robert is with Jefferson when he goes to Philadelphia to write the Declaration of Independence. He travels around with him. And the family, it's one of those, as, as I said, a very, very bizarre configuration with these people who are, who are enslaved and free, owner and owned, in this one place. Um, the first section ends with Martha Jefferson's death in 1782, which was a calamity for Jefferson. Um, and he decides to go to Paris to, and to accept a commission to Paris. And he takes James Hemings, another one of his uh, wife's half-siblings, with him and his daughter Martha to Paris. And he wants to have James trained as a cook. Jefferson had very, very, uh, well, exquisite, very high taste. He wanted a French chef at Monticello, so James was to be trained as a chef. And in this section of the book called The Vaunted Scene of Europe, I talk about James Hemings and then later Sally Hemings in Paris with Jefferson. And this to me was the most exciting part of the book because you don't typically think of American enslaved people outside of the context of their plantation. Here you have two young African American people who are in France in the 18th century. And when you're, in 18th, when you're in France in the 18th century, you're really in France. If you go to France today, before you get out of the airport, you see English everywhere. English companies, in the American companies, things that are familiar, they are in that world at that time period. And the second part of this book talks about their lives there, the things they do. James Hemings trains in some of the best kitchens in Paris. Um, Sally Hemings and James Hemings are paid wages while they are there. They're also technically free people. They have the opportunity to petition for their freedom there. And so it's a very, very different setup for them, being paid and having nominal freedom <coughs> at that time period. So I end this section of the book with, well, the controversy where actually there's sort of a, a conflict between Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings because when he's ready to go back home, she doesn't want to go. Her son says she had, well, she'd learned French. They'd been there for years, and she was a young person. It's easier to learn the language then. She, and she was free. She didn't want her children to be enslaved. And she knew that any child she had in Virginia would be a slave because Virginia followed the Roman rule, partis sequitur ventrum. In other words, you were what your mother was. Now, that's not the rule that the English colonists came over with. In England, you were what your father was. But if you think about setting up a slave system, how much more sense it makes to have slavery go through the woman as opposed to the man. Men can have many more children than, than women, uh, and the sexuality of men is much more controlled, see, of women is much more controlled than that of men. So to avoid having a large class of mixed race free people, they switched the rule. And, and they said, well, we're like the Romans. We're not like the English anymore. So she knew that all of her children would be enslaved. Jefferson promised her that her children would be freed, that she would have a good life at Monticello, and if she would come home. Now, she's 16 years old at this point. So we stop here and think, a 16-year-old is not the same as a 16-year-old today. 16-year-old <laughs> in the 18th century is not the same as a 16-year-old today. But that's still very, very young. And you wonder, I mean, as I'm writing this, my daughter at the same time was 16. And so you're thinking, now, I, as I said, I know it's different. I mean, we've taken adolescence and prolonged it to like 30 now. Uh, <laughs> so I know it's not the same thing, but you still think about the youth of this person. But then you also think about the fact that she has a family back home. And if you were an enslaved person, what would you do? Would you take your freedom and be by yourself, perhaps? Or do you go through whatever you're going through with your family? But for whatever, she trusts Jefferson, and she came home. And so I end the second section there, and I take up the third section, which is called the, On the Mountain, which is really about the Hemingses from the 1790s until Jefferson's death. Here, the story expands to talk more about John Hemings. If anybody has been to Monticello, you know John Hemings was the master carpenter there. And some of his handiwork is still, you know, you can still see it at Monticello right now. 
uh, Burl Colbert. These were other people who figure very, very much in the life at Monticello. So I opened the story up, talk about the children of Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings, um, who spent, I was very, very much surprised to find in doing this research, quite a bit of time with Jefferson. Not so much at Monticello, but at Poplar Forest, which was his home away from home. When Jefferson retired, hordes of people began to visit him, and they would stay for like weeks at a time. He'd have a dozen visitors, and they'd bring all their, their horses and their children and everything, and they'd stay, and he'd feed everybody, which was one of the reasons that he had difficulty, difficult you know, financial circumstances near the end. So I talk all about that in that second, sec, the last section, and the book ends with the real calamity at Monticello. Jefferson dies in 1826, $107,000 in debt. $107,000 in 1826 is millions of dollars. Uh, it's a calamity for his legal white family. It's even more of a calamity for the enslaved people at Monticello. 130 of them are auctioned off, many of them never to see their families ever again. Members of the Hemings family, some of them are auctioned off, but others gain their freedom either informally or formally. So it's a bad ending for everybody here, as, as I said, for Jefferson's legal white family, but even much more so for the enslaved people. I end the book with the story of Joseph Fawcett, who is a grandson, who's also a Hemings. He's a grandson of Elizabeth Hemings. He is freed in Jefferson's will, but his wife and children are not. So he spends the next few years, and he, what he does, he goes to the white community and also some of his Hemings relatives, and he has them buy some of his children and they promise to sell them back to him once he has gained enough money to do it. Uh, everybody goes along with it except one man who refuses to sell Peter Hemings, his youngest son, who is 11. He refuses to sell Peter back to his parents, even though they have the money for it. And they stick around as long as they can in Virginia, which has become a very, very volatile place after the Nat Turner Rebellion. And they go out to Ohio and there's something of a happy ending because Peter Fawcett, when he becomes a man, actually buys his freedom and he joins his family in Cincinnati. He becomes a minister and a prominent caterer and he and his family become very much involved in the Underground Railroad in Cincinnati, spiriting other people to freedom. And I end with that story and not Sally Hemings and her line because it represents to me what this story, it, it sort of seems to me that this, this, these people represent what this story is all about. Perseverance, faith in family, <clears throat> faith in yourself. They never lose hope. And through all of unimaginable circumstances, they stick together and go forward and create this family whose life, I think, is, is it sort of exemplifies a lot of what African-American lives are like, but also the lives of other whites as well, because the story is about enslaved people, but in talking about them as individuals, I really, really wanted to show the points of commonality, the points of humanity that exist among whites and blacks, enslaved people and free people as well, as a way of telling this story through this particular family. So with that, I think I'm supposed to take questions from the audience. I have to apologize. It's very dusty. <laughs> and I have contacts too. And it, there's a little. Uh, yes, yeah. yeah, so, uh, you mentioned that some of the Hemings are, were uh, literate. I'm just interested to in how, you, what kind of information with their letters or things that you got from the slave side of the family. How much literacy was there? Well, it's interesting. Um, as I mentioned, the Hemings Whale siblings, the children of John Wales, we know that Robert and James, we have, we have writings from James Hemings. Robert Hemings' correspondence with Jefferson is missing. I mean, it's one of those nightmares you have as a historian. It's like, I would love to see those letters. But Jefferson, and the other kind of record he kept was something called the Sum Summary Journal of Letters. So he wrote, any time he wrote a letter, he noted it, any letter that came in. So we know that Robert Hemings wrote to him, but I don't have those letters. James Hemings' letter, um, you know, writing of the kitchen utensils, uh, listing of all of the things in the kitchen, we have show a very, I mean, no misspellings, very, very confident 
very, very good handwriting. John Hemings's letters show someone who uh, spelled phonetically, but was you know, obviously a very, very intelligent man. You get a sense of his connection to Jefferson from that, from the letters. I mean, how Jefferson is much more formal with him. He is much more, I guess I could say, more forward in his, his, um, his writings to Jefferson. Uh, so it's, you go through and you get information about what the family's doing, what they're feeling and so forth, but it's very, very uneven because we don't have anything from Sally Hemings. Uh, we don't have anything from her other sisters. It's mainly the males that we know, we know about there. So it's a, it's a wide variety of information that's, that's contained in these things. Pardon me? Where, you get, where is the, are the letters and things that you found from the letters? Well, some of the letters are, Je many of Jefferson's letters have been published. So they would be, some of these things are included in the volumes of the papers of Thomas Jefferson and also the Massachusetts Historical Society. Most of John Hemings' letters are in the 18-teens, and they haven't gotten to that yet. Uh, so they have not been published. So you have to go to the Massachusetts Historical Society to see those letters. Um, oh, on, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Annette, uh, if you read the hundreds of books on Jefferson, he was, had a tremendous ego. Very e a tremendous what? ego, very uh, egotistical, as an understatement. Uh, now, his, the Hemings were his family throughout his, most of his life. Do you see in the letters, I mean, you might not be able to say this as a historian, how the Hemings affected his persona, whether he stayed an egotist at the beginning or whether he melted as a result in 1826, he, he broke down. Uh, do you see this in the letters where you know, personal conversations going on between the Hemings and Jefferson, or he just was the ego the egotist. Oh. The ego. <laughs> egotist. You break, you, do the Hemings just make him less egotistical, you're saying? Or? Affect his persona in, in any way. You know, I think they were, particularly those six siblings, were in such a different category of people for him. I don't know, and he was that way about them from the very beginning. I mean, in the memorandum book that I talked about, you have James and Robert, he's paying them to, you know, catch mockingbirds for him. He liked to keep mockingbirds. So I don't, I don't think that they, I don't have any sense that his connection to them over the years changed him because they were so different. These are, I mean, these are his wife's siblings. And so it's hard to say. I mean, obviously they're different. I'm gonna at some point do a biography of Jefferson and one of the things that I really do want to try to pay more attention to is the various stages of his life. To think about that, you know, because he tends to be written of as if it's one, Jefferson is one thing, but we're all, I mean, I'm not the same person. I'm, I'm the same person, but I'm, as I was when I was 21, but I'm someone who has had experience. And so it, my experiences is color, have colored what I view things. So I think that's something that I really want to try to investigate. I can't, I haven't been able to do it for, for for this book, but that is, I think, something that I, that I want to see further. Uh, before your books were published, I visited Monticello and remember a, a staff member told me that um, one of the few slaves that Thomas Jefferson freed had founded the AME Church in Ohio and was a successful caterer, which <laughs> sounds like one you described. Mm -hmm. But I was curious, of the freed slaves that Jefferson did release, how would you evaluate in their freedom, their financial success and independence, and you know their spiritual vitality. Uh. That's a very, it's a very good question. Uh, he, as I said, he, you know, Peter Fawcett is who you're talking about. Uh, Jefferson uh, did not free him. He, as I said, he ended up getting his freedom later on. But Cinder Stanton and Diane Swan Wright at Monticello were doing a project called Getting Word. And they're interviewing all of the descendants of enslaved people at Monticello, not just the Hemingses, but all of them. So they spent a lot of time on that question. And Cinder has been tracing what people have done. There have been, and I, as a matter of fact, am going to be doing a second volume of, of the Hemings story. And I'm going to be looking at them in the 19th century just on that point. There are a number of very prominent people um, who come through that line. And for particularly the ones, I, I should say, the ones who were emancipated early, obviously this would make sense. The earlier you, you're emancipated, the better the prospects are. You can get a head start on things. So <clears throat> there are 
uh, William Monroe Trotter, who was uh, a famous civil rights activist. He was with W.E.B. Du Bois, helped founding the Niagara Movement that became the NAACP. He is a descendant of Elizabeth Hemings. He's a member of the Hemings family. There are other people. See, one, what I'm going to do in my book, one line stays in the white family, and another line, excuse me, stays in the black community. Another line goes into the white community. And the whites do very, very well, very early on. Sally Hemings' grandchildren are wealthy people, the ones who identify as white. The ones who are black have a better time, but a much more mixed legacy there. So that's one of the things I'm going to be looking at. And as I said, Diane and Cinder have sort of done a preliminary take on it and are going to be doing a book themselves. So, and they're finding some very, very interesting things. There, there is, there's something about, apparently, the association with Monticello, in a way, that kept people together and also seems to have been, she said in many ways, one of the things she says very, very well is that the people who were enslaved sort of did more toward advancing Jefferson's legacy in the Declaration of Independence, fighting for equality, than people who were on his legal, descent, his legal descendants. So yeah, there, there's very definitely something there, a connection between Monticello and what happens to people later on. What became of Jupiter Evans, who'd been with him so intimately uh, in the first part of his life and then whom he replaced when he wasn't that far along in it? Uh, Jupiter, after he, after he ceases to be Jefferson's manservant, body servant, however you want to call it, begins, he becomes Jefferson's coachman and he's in charge of Jefferson's horses. He dies in 1800. He goes to a doctor who gives, they ha I love these things, these phrases, kill or cure, right? This will kill you or cure you. Uh, well, it killed him. And he dies in, the 18, in 1800. So uh, he's still connected to Jefferson. He drives Jefferson as a coachman, but he's not, he's not, the, he's not the intimate manservant anymore. Hi, Annette. Um, I guess first I want to say how much I admire your courage you gave me a clue to it when you said, because your experience, you didn't think it would be out of bounds that you know Jefferson and Sally Hemings would be together. But I know it kicked up a dust storm in the certain segments of this population. So I'm sure you've had to weather a few storms. What I think is interesting is even during that time, especially the 1790s, when it was the Jeffersonian Republicans versus the Hamiltonian Federalists. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of talk about Jefferson and Hat Sally Hemings and some of the broadsheets, like I think Benjamin Franklin's um, grandson, Benjamin Franklin Bach and the Aurora, would, they'd slip little things in now and then. So it was known then. Yeah, well, that's, that's the interesting point. It was something that people alluded to. If, if people have been, if you know New York City at all, you know the New York Post, and they have a page six, which is sort of the gossip page things. You know, they have blind items. You know, what person was seen doing something? Well, that's the kind of thing that they did in the 1790s before. James Callender was the person who really broke the story in 1802. But even before then, there were people who were hinting about Mr. J, a person at the highest levels of government and so forth. So this was something that was talked about all throughout the 1790s. Once she comes back from France in 1790, people began to talk about this. A second question that is off the track, but I was not really sure how it worked out. In Jamestown, when the first African Americans arrived, they were indentured servants. They were not slaves. Ooh, well, people go back and forth on that. Some of those people, they, some of them do end up owning property, which indicates that they were free at some point. Oh, maybe I should ask somebody, because it's a detailed question. Yeah, so, okay. But thank you for your time. Thank you very much. I think it's uh, great you've done so much work on ordinary people, both black and white. Mm -hmm. But I would be interested in knowing, since you've worked so much with Jefferson, what are your feelings about him? What are my feelings about Jefferson? Well, um, they're complicated feelings about Jefferson. He is someone who absolutely has to be reckoned with in American history. I, he's the most fascinating person to me, the most fascinating person in American history. That's my reaction to him. And I, I really, um, there's sometimes I like him very much, and sometimes I read things and I get very, very angry. If you're reading the farm book and you're seeing people 
treated like chattel, which is what slavery is about, and I could do that for any slave owner, you get angry, but you have to pull back from that if you really want to try. You never have complete objectivity as a historian, but you should try to, you should aspire to it. I, I love writing about Jefferson and reading about Jefferson. I think, I, I guess the only thing I can say is he is the most fascinating person in American history. There's nobody that, whose life you could look at and see so many different facets, race, science, politics, Native American policy, he is everywhere. And so that's, that's my basic response. Thank you. Uh, in uh, Jefferson's uh, Notes on the State of Virginia, there's a uh, famous section, of course, that is uh, in which uh, Jefferson expressed truly vilely racist uh, sentiments about black people. Mm -hmm. I mean, the crudest sort of, sort of uh, feelings and judgments that uh, uh, recur throughout racist American thinking ever after. Um, how do you uh, square that with the long, his long relationship with Sally Hemings? Uh, as you said a few minutes ago, Jefferson is not frozen in time. He changed as all people changed. Uh, do you think that his long experience, in, uh, intimate experience with Sally, changed his, his visceral feelings about African Americans in general, or whether he was able to maintain truly contradictory ideas about black people in his mind at the same time? I think that he was able to maintain truly contradictory feelings about blacks. And I, it's not, an, if you grow up in the South, it is not a phenomenon for blacks and whites to have generalized racial views, but see individual people differently. You know, I mean, the, Sally Hemings and her siblings are special to, were special to him in a certain sort of way. And it's not unusual, I think, for people to have a set of intellectual beliefs that they don't that their emotional lives don't jibe with in that way. So I think it is a con I mean, it is possible. I've known people who were racist. Some of the people who have been the most helpful to me in my life, if you were to sit down and talk to them, they would express sentiments that were racist sentiments. But it's it's the lack of not. Well, it's hard to put it this way, but there are malicious people who are non-racist, and there are malicious people who are racist, and the the malice in people. It sometimes overtakes them. I don't, I don't see Jefferson as a malicious person. So I think he could have these intellectual views about black people, but on his individual dealings with people, it could be totally different. And I see that all the time, you know, growing up in the South and other places as well. We're not consistent. He's not, and we aren't either. I think we're, is that it? I think I, I've, he's holding up an overtime sign. <laughs> Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.